Christ is my firm foundation, the rock on which I stand when everything around me is shaking. I've never been more glad that I put my faith in Jesus, because he's never
because she was too ashamed to go in the morning with the rest of the woman. And he starts this conversation with her, and he's like, would you get me a drink of water at the well? And then she's completely taken off guard. She's like, why would you, a Jew, even speak to me? And he goes on to say in John 4, 10, if you only knew the gift God has for you and who you're speaking to right now, you would ask me, and I would give you living water. And he's like, this water that I give, if anyone would drink from, they would never thirst again. And of course, she's thinking about her flesh, and she's like, okay, give me some of that water. That's exactly what I need. But then he's like, well, go and get your husband. And then he reveals to her, you know what? Like, I know exactly where you're at in life. I know your failures. I know your mistakes. I know that you've had five husbands, and the man you're living with now is not your husband. And then they have a conversation, but he goes on anyways, even after he's like, I know where you're at in life. I know you've made a few mistakes. He is still like, I am the Messiah. Like he reveals himself to her anyways. And what happens after he reveals who he is, is she practically drops her pail and her shame at the well, and she runs back to the village. And she goes and tells everybody what had just happened. And my next title in my Bible is Many Samaritans Believe. You see, Jesus chose the woman nobody else would have even held a conversation with to start the very first revival in Samaria. And what this teaches me about our God today is that he knows exactly where we're at. He knows the sins that we struggle with. He knows when we feel like we've been an outcast. He knows our failures and our mistakes, every single one of them. And he still says that you are the one that he loves. You are the one that he has good plans for he has a purpose for you are the one regardless of what you've ever done that he wants to reveal himself to that he wants to have a relationship with you and I don't know if anything else has never made you fall in love with God this story every single time makes me fall more and more in love with who our God is would you believe that that is true for you today Uh, Lord, today we praise you for this word. We praise you uh, for our Bibles. We praise you for the word that Rusty is going to bring. In this room, I just want to lift up a praise to you, God. I pray that we would be able to praise you authentically and freely, God. I pray that we would believe the story was true 2,000 years ago, but we believe it's true for our lives today, God, that no matter what we've done, you see us and you still love us and you have plans for us and you don't want to leave us in our pain, God, but you want to call us out of it. Today we praise you and we love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Would y'all stand up and give him some worship this morning? The praying God come and turn this thing around. God turn it around. God turn it around. God turn it around.
God, turn it around. God, turn it around. Yes, God, turn it around. God, turn it around. God, turn it around. Right now, he is up to something. He is up to something. God is doing something. Right now, he is healing someone. He is saving someone. God is doing something. Right now, he is healing someone. He is saving someone. God is doing something. Right now, he is healing. No, I'm no longer a slave. 
Good morning, good morning. I uh, heard a story about a guy that was working with a lady at a nursing home, and she, uh, she had been born blind, and he was going through her day of the week with her, and as he's going with her through things, he saw how difficult things were for her, and so by the end of the week, he looked at her, and he said, could there be anything worse than being blind? The lady said to him, she said, yes, being able to see and having no vision. You know, we, we tend to think sometimes our struggles, they, they, they might seem big to other people or maybe they seem big to us, but sometimes in reality, they're not as big as some of the other things. You all with me? There's always seems to be something bigger. And today I want to talk to you about not sweating the small stuff. Now, this is easy for some and harder for others. I was telling folks last Wednesday, you know, Angie loves to have a clean house. She is a neat freak. And so in the mornings when we get out of bed, the last one out of bed, usually me, gets to make the bed. But I've always had this argument, we're just going to get right back into it later. And I'm like, don't sweat the small stuff. Nobody else even sees our bedrooms. She says, but I do. And so we, we make the bed every day. And uh, it looks nice. It really does. She likes the windows to be open, the curtains, you know. She likes everything to have its spot. And maybe you're like that too. Reminds me of a story about Mary and Martha. You all remember them? There in the Bible, Jesus is walking along in Luke chapter 10. Starting in verse 38, not our main scripture today, but it says this, as Jesus and his disciples went along, they were on their way, they came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. She had her sister called Mary, she, she had a sister called Mary, who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he had to say. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made, and she came to him and asked, Lord... Don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work by myself? Tell her to help me. Martha, Martha. I love how Jesus addresses her. The Bible talks about when somebody repeats your name in the Bible, it's, it's an act of endearment. Martha, Martha, it will be okay. Just chill out. The Lord answers, you are worried and upset about many things, but few things are needed or indeed only one, Mary has chosen what is better, and it will be, not be taken away from her. The preparations, he said, that had to be made. Somebody's got to do it, don't they? You know, maybe that's your defense. Maybe you're on the other side of that line talking about, you know, I know it's small stuff, but somebody still has got to do the small stuff in order for everything to kind of come together Reminds me of church a little bit. We have the cleaning team, the setup team, the hospitality team, the, you know, the, uh, all of the, the setup, takedown, all. I was teasing Jeff this morning. I walked out. I like to tease him. He helped me with the, the lights this week, getting them all set up. And I was like, I don't know, kind of looks a little bit. And he's like, yeah, it'll be okay. You know, because it's really not about the lights, Right? Uh, uh, sometimes, um, you know, I'm, I'm the stickler for Sunday morning. I want to make sure everything is in its place. I texted Melissa, uh, last night and I asked her, I said, did we get the baptistry set up? Is the water being warm? She said, absolutely. I said, thank you so much. You're the best. Cause I didn't want them to fake the Holy Spirit in them. You know, whenever they get in the cold water and they're like, woo, uh, I didn't, I want to be warm water, right? <laughs> Like that's just you know straight out of the out of the pump is cold. I wrote this down. Don't worship the process of church. Religious, right? But worship the Christ, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, the head of the church. That's who we worship. I love it. Don't sweat the small stuff. Luke 10, 42. <clears throat> but few things are needed, Jesus said. 
or in fact only one. And Mary chose to do the best of them all. She's sitting right at Jesus' feet, just taking it all in. Just taking it all in. And I'm so glad that you guys come this morning to just take it all in. If you got your Bibles, open them up to Matthew chapter 28, 18 through 20. Actually, 16 through 20 is the, the real uh, breakdown of all those verses together. I'm going to key in on 18 through 20. Probably um, <clears throat> one of my favorite passages because I don't have to wonder what God wants me to do in life. He tells us what to do in life. You know, Jeremiah 29, 11 says, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you, not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. It all sums up, actually, in this passage, because it doesn't matter who you are, uh, what your job is, uh, if you're young and you're in school still, or you're old and you're retired, it does not matter. God is not done with you. God has a plan and a purpose and a meaning for all of our lives together, and it's summed up in Matthew 28. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, comma, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, comma, and teaching them to obey everything that I've commanded you. And surely I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. He's given us direction. He's given us a step-by-step -step plan of what he's called you and me to do. And he starts off with the go part. And make me known to the nations, right? I might fall down. The big idea is I wish I had focused on what really mattered. You know, I think about folks that get along through their life and maybe they've been busy with lots of preparing for things. Like we get busy preparing for retirement, don't we? We get busy preparing for the next phase of our marriage, you know, when the kids grow up and they move out of the house, or maybe we're moving into grandparenting stage, or maybe we're moving into great-grandparenting stage, but we, we begin to look ahead, and there's nothing wrong at looking ahead, but sometimes we look back and we say, I wish I would have known that. I wish maybe I would have done that just a little bit different, and I don't care how young or how old you are, you can start today if you haven't yet. You can begin now. Note to self this morning. We, we got this picture of um, a sticky note. We talked about just covering the back wall with those post-it notes. That would have been fun. Would have had to repaint the whole thing again. But that first one there is don't sweat the small stuff. Here's what I want you to see on your listing guide. First things first. That's your... You're blank there. First things first. He's, got, he's given us in this scripture an order, and he keeps the first thing first. He says, therefore, go. That could mean as you go. The words uh, here, therefore, indicate that as you go through the traveling pattern of your life, make disciples. I love it. Uh, uh, there's a guy. Um, boy, I'm trying to just lost his name. Uh, pastors. He's one of the youngest mega church pastors on the planet, wrote the, the, the book Radical, David Platt, that's his name. And David Platt has a question that he asks whenever you come back from a mission trip. Used to, we would come back and we would talk about how many people got saved, how many people accepted Jesus as Lord and Savior. But David Platt says, how many people did you make disciples of? Those are very different things. You see, somebody can say, I prayed and I asked God to be the Lord of my life, but did they walk with God after that? Did they follow God after they said those things? Because the truth is, if we've not submitted, if we've not surrendered our life to God, we can pray a prayer, go to a class, uh, all kinds of things, and Christ not be the Lord of our life. We truly might not be saved if we are not a disciple of Jesus. That's what salvation is. Somebody who says, I'm no longer going to live for me. I'm going to live and follow Christ. And so he tells us, go and make disciples. Go make followers of Christ. He says, make, go and make disciples of all nations. Keep the main thing, the main thing. 2 Corinthians 5, 16 through 21, the apostle Paul writes this. So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view, though we once regarded Christ in this way. We do so no longer. 
I used to think that Jesus was a phony, Paul says. I, I followed God. I was a Jew of Jews. I was a Pharisee of Pharisees. I knew the scripture very well. I knew it so well that when Jesus come along, Paul's saying, I didn't believe him. And so I began to go and find people that were of the way, and I would uh, have them tortured. I would have them imprisoned, and I would even have them killed. I would be a part of murdering Christians. But, but I don't view Christ that way anymore because he became real to me. Like, like I had an experience with God that changed my life. The Bible tells us in another place there in Mark, it says that Jesus said, but I, if I am lifted up, I will draw all men unto myself. He, uh, in Romans chapter 10 verse uh, 17 says that uh, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. That Romans chapter 1 16 says that it is the gospel, the word of God is the power unto salvation. For anyone who would believe, he says. When we preach Christ, when we preach the gospel, when we preach the word of God, and we lift up Jesus, he begins to draw all men to himself, just like he did in the days of the Bible. He does still to this day. Uh, Most of us sitting here have experienced a time in our life where we didn't necessarily hear God audibly, but God put a drawing on our heart through the conviction of the Holy Spirit, revealing to us, our need for him for salvation. For me, I was 15 years old when I felt that feeling in my heart and in my life. It was like a a still small voice, kind of like a guilty conscience. That's what I felt. And I knew that I hadn't trusted Christ as Savior and Lord. I knew that I hadn't surrendered my life to him and said, God, not my life, but your life. Not my will, but your will. I want to live for you. I, I hadn't got to that place yet. But at 15, I remember sitting in that seat, listening to the guy preach, talking about not giving just a little piece of my life to, to God, but giving him all of my heart. And at that time, I surrendered and I, I followed Christ. He said, we don't view anyone the way we used to view them. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. Paul's saying, I don't murder Christians anymore. Matter of fact, I I am one. I once did not believe, but now I do. He says, the old is gone, the new is here, and the new is here. All of this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, that God is reconciling reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting Uh, people sins against them, and he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassador. I love it. He gave us the ministry, and that's the job, and he gave us the message. That's what we're to tell. That's the gospel. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors. We're his mouthpiece, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. And then he gives the gospel in one sentence. Paul says, God made him who had no sin, that was Jesus, to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So he's telling us here in Matthew 28 to go and make disciples of all nations, every tribe, every people group. You see in Revelation chapter 7, verse 9, also in, in Revelation 5, 9, but 7, 9 says this, after this, the John the Revelator said, I looked and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, tribe, people, and language. I love it. He's told us to go. To share with the entire world. Acts chapter 1 verse 8. He tells us another way. But you will receive power. When the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses. In Jerusalem. And in Judea. And in Samaria. This one got me this morning. That's where the woman at the well was. She was a Samaritan. She was an outcast. That. Samaritans were not liked by the Jews. The the Samaritans were considered as dogs, that they were so simple and so dirty, and people that they they only believed part of the Scripture. They didn't believe all of the Scripture. Therefore, they were rejected by God's people. But Jesus went there. What's he saying here is, you will be my witnesses to Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria. Like where your enemies are, you will be my witness to to your enemies and to the ends of the earth. I think that what he's telling us this morning is don't lose sight of the mission. There was a, a, a big ship that was being built in 1950 and 51. It was called the SS United States. 
It was 990 feet long. It held about 14,000 people. And when they were building it, the government heard about it, and they said, let us invest $50 million of the $79 million. That way, when we go into battle, we can transport soldiers. They say the ship is unsinkable. It's unburnable. Warrior ships can't catch it. Like It even holds the transatlantic Atlantic record for the, past, the fastest passenger ship still to this day. But it was never used to, as a troop carrier. It became a luxury cruise ship. They said we can get troops to the battlefield fast, but all it was is a luxury ship for the wealthy. In 1969, it had its last customer. And in 1996, it found its home at Pier 82 on the Delaware River in Philadelphia. Still sits there today. It has changed ownership, and no one knows what to do with the ship anymore. See, the church is like that ship. It's a troop carrier. It's not a luxury liner. It's a war vessel, not a tourist attraction. We are on mission for Jesus, and we must keep the first thing first. The second thing I want you to see this morning is baptism is important. You see, as we go through there, he's saying, uh, all authority has been given to me, therefore go and make disciples of all nations. Baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. This is one primary command with three subordinate participles. Go, baptize, and teach. In Galatians 3.26 it says, So in Christ Jesus you are all children of God through faith. For all of you who are who were baptized into Christ, have clothed yourself with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Gentile. You're, you're all the same now, neither slave nor free. You're all the same now, nor is there male or female, for all, you are all one in Christ Jesus. I believe many have made too much out of baptism. Uh, there are uh, groups today that say that you, after you give your life to Jesus, you must be baptized in order to be saved. Here's Here's one of the scriptures that is used for that. Mark chapter 16, verse 16, it says, Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. Whoever believes and is baptized, uh, it makes me think, though, wait a minute, what about the guy that was on the cross? The thief that was beside Jesus that he said, Remember me this day, and he said, This day you will be with me in paradise. A guy that was seeking God's forgiveness, Jesus understood with very little words being spoken and said to him, I get it, and I get you. And the only requirement was to see him as Lord and believe in your heart. That's what Romans chapter 10, 9 says, that if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. doesn't say and baptized. Now, we have this scripture here. What do we do with that? Well, <laughs> I think sometimes we can make too little out of baptism. Some can make too much, and some can make too little. You say, Rusty, what are you talking about? Well, in Matthew chapter 10, 32 and 33, Jesus says that if you acknowledge me before men, I'll acknowledge you before my Father in heaven, but if you deny me before men, I'll deny you before my Father in heaven. Baptism is simply an outward expression of an inward commitment. I can show everyone else out here that I am a follower of Jesus because I've been baptized in his likeness. I want to be baptized. Also, a good reason to be baptized is because God's word here in Matthew 28, it's, it's a command, right? It's, a, it's, it's part of the Great Commission. Go and make disciples. Baptize them. It's an act of obedience that I should be obedient to Christ. I, I love it. We have so many folks. We have a, a place on our, um, on our app. If you haven't got it yet, I hope you will get the LifePoint app. You can just go to whatever app store you have and type in LifePoint Sedalia and you'll find LifePoint's app. And there on the app, there's a place that says, I want to sign up for baptism. So maybe you gave your life to Jesus some other time, some other place. But you say, Rusty, I've never been scripturally baptized. Baptism means submersion, totally under the water. And I want to do that. I want to experience baptism in that way. Friend, we want to be a part of that with you. And we want to share with you what it means and what it looks like. Just sign up there. We want to go along with you. This is an act of obedience. It's an obedient thing. I love what Max Lucado said. Here's what he said. Baptism is the initial step 
of a faithful heart. That after I give my life to Jesus, I don't get baptized because I have to to be saved. I get baptized because I want to be saved, and I'm not ashamed. It's the celebration. I'm showing everybody else that I'm dying to my old self, and I'm raising a new life in Jesus Christ. I like to say this, if we can't obey the first act of obedience, that's baptism, as a follower, how will we ever follow anything else? Y'all hear about the squirrels that went crazy inside the church? Ran up some lady's dress, freaked her out. Deacons got together with the pastor. They said, what are we going to do about this, pastor? He said, I don't know. I'm going to need a little time to think about it, man. The squirrels are going crazy. <laughs> a couple days later, a preacher said, meet me at the church, boys. I got a plan. Fill up that baptistry full of water. You guys catch the squirrels, bring them to me one at a time, I'm going to baptize them. <laughs> Deacon looked at the preacher, he said, what are you talking about? How is that going to work? He said, well, it seems like every time we baptize somebody, we quit seeing them. It's funny, but it's not funny. Because baptism means so much more than just a religious activity. Remember, it's not that small thing. This is actually a bigger thing because it's an act of obedience it has to be about following Jesus, not an event of baptism. Here's the last thing I want you to see this morning. Obedience is key to experiencing the joy of the Lord. It's key. And he said in Matthew 28, 20, and teach them to obey everything that I've commanded you. I saw it another place in John 15, 9. As the Father has loved me, Jesus said, these are red letters in your Bible. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commandments, right? If you keep my commands. He's saying, if you obey my word, <laughs> you will remain in my love just as I have kept my Father's commands and I remain in his love. And then he says in verse 11, I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. I've said this before, but I really love that movie with Will Smith in it, In the Pursuit of Happiness. People just want to be happy today. We talked about it last week. Y'all remember the song? I won't bring it up. If you weren't here, you got to go back and watch it. People are in the pursuit of happiness. They, I, I get people come in my office, husbands and wives, and they, they're talking about leaving one another because they just want to be happy, and this person doesn't make them happy anymore. They're going to leave the job they've been at for 30 years because they're just not happy anymore. And really, there's something else deep inside of us that we need. There's a a God-sized hole in our heart that can only be filled by the joy of the Lord. That's it. And when we experience it, it's like we spend the rest of our life trying to find that joy again. Like it slipped away from us somehow. Like it, it got away and, and we're trying to catch it. I remember as a youngster, the first time I ever felt that kind of joy was probably at 13, 14 years of age. Went to youth camp. It was a church camp. Didn't think I was going to like it, but there were pretty girls there, so I wanted to go. They got there. They told us we're not going to play our Nintendos. We're not going to do any of these things. We're just going to get up in the morning and have what they call quiet time. <laughs> For a 13, 14-year-old boy, quiet time is a very hard time. Like, uh, I don't know what you all are talking about. They wanted us to read this scripture they gave us on a piece of paper, and then we needed to sit there on the park bench or wherever we found by ourselves, and we needed to pray and talk to God. And then later on in the day, we would have some Bible study time that would be with a group, 